go. Ah, Renata has come in. Yes, uh, I have uh, friends in East L.A. and other parts of L.A., downtown L.A., who are talking about the fireworks. And I'm like, hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> go, go, go have a blue parade. Um, good. We, the humans are almost pa at par with the A.I. note takers. Very almost. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very exciting. Uh, it's all good. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So we'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes to get more. More folks in here. Yeah, da, da, da. yeah. No, I'm I always find it funny when the, the note takers show up without the humans. Um <laughs> and it's um right. Uh and I'm thinking, okay, you know, fine. You 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 know, you, you got your capture device, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh it's you know, an interesting new world we are venturing I, into. I always love the recaps it, it's really funny you know oh yeah uh it's sort of it's, 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 chris started talking about this and speaker two and da 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 <laughs> and i'm like really that's that's the height of your okay <laughs> well yeah i mean <laughs> and now he's talking to us right, right exactly no the one that happened last night i was doing a one-on-one -on -one call and the note taker said i can't hear you if, oh, if, if, if you know, I'm going to leave here in a minute if I don't hear anything. I thought, well, who asked you? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't invite you, or maybe we did. So, don't know. all right, Yay. let's uh, well, let's give it one here, more. So if, yeah, if Deirdre's here. We we have the core group here, but I I think uh, uh, we're we'll probably be waiting. Let me just make sure that I'm not getting messages from people. Sure. Uh, Okay, I'm sure more people will come in, but we're four minutes after the hour here, and um, it's Halloween, and maybe that's what's holding some people back, uh, but we are recording this, so for those who missed this, shame on you, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, number one, uh, there will be a witch's curse placed on you, which will be done uh, in the metaverse, uh, or whatever we're calling it now. Uh, the, the the spatial verse, uh, but um, very excited here because somebody uh, who I, I've been a big fan of for a couple of years now, and her work with Ferryman Collective is just getting so much great attention and kudos. Uh, and you know, I I titled this presentation uh, discussion "Defeating Dystopia and XR," and you'll find out why. Uh, because uh, what Witten Frank, who is our presenter here, welcome Witten Frank from Ferryman Collector. Uh, she and her team produced Uncanny Alley, A New Day. And uh, it's a really interesting live immersive experience. So you're uh, basically fighting digital surveillance and oppressive regimes and um, sounds very much like real life. Uh, but um, you, you'll hear a bit more. And it was recently, uh, I believe you were at... Um, uh, you've been all over the place, but tell us where you were before we get into to talking about what uh, Uncanny Alley is. I think you were uh, at the sure. Venice Biennale, right? <laughs> we were. We, uh, we, go. we got back from Venice uh, second week of September. So that was the world premiere for Uncanny Alley, which is quite a big feather in our cap, although uh, we have been there with shows three, two yeah, times really. before this. So, you know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and 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 that's no small feat, number one. Um, and for those who don't know, of course, the Venice Biennale has really become, uh, in the last, I'd say, six years or so, has really become a, a, a kind of a a magnet for uh, live immersive theater. Um, some of our our dear friends who have been here before, Kira Benzing and others who who are doing really interesting work, blending live audiences. Uh, with um, uh, whether it's in headset experiences or others, um, so so congrats on that. Uh, but um, but yeah, I'm I'm going to turn it over to you now, Witten, <laughs> and uh, we'll come back and talk some more. But uh, uh, without further ado, Witten Frank. Hi everyone. Um, so as Chris said, I'm a member of Ferryman Collective, and we specialize. If you don't know, although I hope that you do. Uh, we specialize in creating live immersive entertainment in virtual reality. These are narrative structure, 
plays that the audience gets to fully participate in. They have agency, they are able to talk, and they are indeed a part and a crucial part of the show. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background just in general on our company, and then we'll do a bit more of a deep dive into our current show, which is, as Chris said, Uncanny Alley. So I think if I... Share my screen. There we go. Let's see. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right, so we are Ferryman Collective and we want to create worlds that people can fully inhabit. My screen sharing is paused. Why? Sorry, Chris. Uh, for some reason, it says. Okay. Try this again. There we go. Okay. So, we are Ferryman Collective, and as I said, we've been creating live entertainment in VR since 2020. Here is a roundup of some of the shows. Our first show was Para, which was a, a sort of proof of concept. It was a Halloween haunt, but in VR. And then we went on to do Krampusnacht, the story of Krampus and how he is involved in the Christmas season. And this was nominated for a PGA Innovation Award. But I would say our biggest and most notable success really started with Welcome to Respite, which was a show that was in collaboration and inspired by a real world production that one of my co-founders, Deirdre, who is here in the call today, and say hi, Deirdre, uh, was a part of, and we approached the director, Lindsay Scoggin, about bringing that into VR. And that was a very successful piece for us it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. It was shown at Venice, and then it won a bunch of the XR Live Experience and just XR Awards for that year. And then later we were approached by a Korean team, Gyoi, about licensing the show to be done in Korean, which was really a wonderful experience. Next, we had Gumball Dreams, which I know many of you have heard of. This had its world premiere at South by Southwest. Oh, sorry, I should clarify. Welcome to Respite is a show about mental health. The audience gets to come in as a child, uh, as Alex, as a child who is suffering from disassociative identity disorder. And we dramatize some of the symptoms of that. For example, the audience gets to experience sleep paralysis and some of their inner thoughts taking on form and coming to life. It's a really beautiful piece, and we had incredible audience reaction to that. So next up, we had Gumball Dreams, which had its world premiere at South by Southwest. Gumball Dreams is a very joyful, wonderful celebration and kind of a rainbow psychedelic journey where the audience comes in as aliens that have been called to help an aging alien transition and pass on. It's incredibly beautiful and fun. <laughs> it again, had a very good audience reaction. And then last year, we worked again with the Korean company Gyoi to take their show, Find Wheelie, and translate it into English for its world premiere at South by Southwest. This is a fun sci-fi adventure where you get to run around and collect things, but you're also potentially trying to figure out what's going on with an evil corporation. And this was cool because last year we actually went to, or this year, we went to Berlin and we were able to do a live version of the show at the same time as we were doing a show in VR. So this is what we do. People love us. A little bit more intense about our shows. And now, of course, 
we've been premiering our current show, Uncanny Alley, A New Day. This is probably one of our most ambitious adventures. This was a collaboration with Rick Treeweek of the Metaverse Crew and Virtual Worlds Company. And this came about because we were able to see his world, Uncanny Alley, last, no, in 2022 at Venice in the Worlds competition. And Steve and the team just fell in love with it. And so we applied for the uh, Unity Community Grant and were granted it. And so that was, this was our idea of a collaboration in the XR community. So, as I said, this was Rick Treeweek and Stephen Buchko, who's another founder of Ferryman Collective, creating a live interactive piece based on Rick's world, Uncanny Alley. And so we were able to expand it and create a fully uh, MetaQuest version that people could see and participate in. The experience of Uncanny Alley is this, a cyberpunk computer whiz named Ghost races against the clock to lead a group of escaped detainees, the audience, and her increasingly sentient service bot Adam to freedom through a hacked portal before the fascist corporation that controls Uncanny Alley can erase their memories using experimental radio frequency technology. So within this, the audience has a lot of freedom and at the end, they get to decide if they're going to help build the new metaverse or stay and fight in the world that already exists. And there are no wrong answers. It's just based on how people feel having gone through the story themselves. So one of the things that inspired Rick's initial world and also the piece itself are some of the data issues in South Africa, which is where Rick is from. So there's a very, very large divide between digital or between rural and urban areas. And often the whole system is completely shut down uh, in a process called load shedding, ostensibly to make sure that there is enough energy for everyone to consistently have some kind of internet access. But there's a lot of concern that the government may be using it to control which areas get access and when and how much. South Africa has one of the highest data costs in the world and it's a, re a real problem. And so within our show, we explore a lot of these things with the government using various experimental technology to control people or control their access to data. And uh, it's quite dystopian. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, we are all working to find a better way to deal with all of this. So here you can see, oh, so you can hear some of our wonderful team members Screaming Colors music. He also created a lot of the anime, all of the animations and the, the soundtrack for the show. Over here on this slide, you can see one of our Miro boards, which gives you an idea of just how much detail goes into every specific scene. This is one of the first scenes that the audience is involved in. They spawn into a jail cell. They don't know what's going on. And they are a little bit like deer in headlights. So here we have all the details of what buttons we might need for the show, where we want various verbiage to be, and how it's going to look. For this show, as I said, it was one of our most ambitious. We had five teams of actors from various parts of the world to be in the show. We wanted to have as many as possible to be as flexible as possible for various time zones. So we had actors in LA, and myself, I was in Venice. We had actors in Canada and uh, New York as well, I think. And also, of course, when actors are in different areas, it, it changes things up completely. But it was a long, uh, long-ish rehearsal process, although probably not long enough for our desires, but about five weeks of rehearsals where the actors are rehearsing with the person that they're generally going to be performing with, but also all the different team members to make sure that if we have to move 
people around due to scheduling, we can or <laughs> due to uh, tech fails like a headset not working or someone not having access to internet all of a sudden. We had our premiere at the Venice Biennale in August and September. This was the 81st Venice Film Festival and we did three shows a day for the time that we were there. And thankfully, people really enjoyed the show. We got a lot of wonderful press and we also ended up winning a collateral award, a fan award called the Fan Heart Three Awards. So the show has gone very well. All right, let me stop sharing now. Okay. <laughs> So that's kind of a very fast, because I know we only have 30 minutes <laughs> run through of what we do and the current show that we're working on. And, and where is it now? Are you are you continuing this? Uh, and uh, because I, I, I have so many questions about the production, <laughs> but also, uh, you know, how how you're rolling this out, because, of course, it was premiered literally just two months ago. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the hard thing with film festivals, and I, I know it's not quite the same in the tech world, but in the film world, and we have to abide by these rules, when you premiere something at a festival, it can't be publicly available. So for the first year of a lot of independent films lives, they're only able to show them at festivals because the idea is it's this exclusive experience and Right, you have a Maybe festival contract for yeah. funding or development or uh, things like that. So it's a little bit tricky for us because, of course, we can't sell tickets for a year or sometimes two years when we're doing the festival circuit with our shows. Our next goal, fingers crossed, everyone, please, is South by Southwest. Uh, Kent by, or not Kent by, <laughs> um, the curator of South by came through the show at Venice and was very positive so we're we're pretty certain that's i i'd next. be surprised if you don't number <laughs> one uh and i look forward to that number two uh so yes we will cross fingers because uh i think this is it's it's, it's really interesting i you know i have so many questions as i said and one of them is of course you, you have this incredible development team but then uh, you know, again, you're, you're, you, you know, how, how you cast and direct, uh, because you've, you've got, you know, a, a kind of a rep company to some extent. Yes. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit about that, you, you know, because I mean, I always find it fascinating and, and some people might not really understand, um, you know, actually how you, you, you do that. I mean, we do it very standardly, I suppose, for the film and theater industries. We, put out, we, we definitely touch base with actors that we've worked with before. And that initially started for Deirdre and myself because we were part of the Under Presents, which used live actors in the Tender Claws video game, the Under Presents, and then in the show, The Tempest that was in that world. So we already had quite a few people that we knew were comfortable with VR, which is <laughs> definitely a thing that's a part of this, right? We do train actors. We end up having to train actors on the headsets themselves, as well as for the show, if they haven't done any VR performance before. But now we have a pretty sizable crew, probably the largest of actors that have been trained by us or have been in multiple shows with us. But when we are in need of more actors, we do put out a casting call and we, or we reach out to people that we know and say, hey, we'd like you to come audition for the show. And so we'll give them text from the show, just like you would for a regular audition. Yeah, it's, it's and, and you know, again, from the standpoint of, of, of where uh, sort of the, you know, the scenic structure and in so almost like the gameplay, I, I think the decision tree is is really fascinating here because, I mean, you're you're getting, uh, uh, you know, pe people immersed even more in trying to make decisions uh, as opposed to just experiencing or uh, or being, you know, a spear carrier, as I was in Kira's thing. And, oh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I think for us, we really try and put the audience at the center of the piece and make them feel, which I would hazard a guess is what people 
want from VR to really actually be mm -hmm. in the thing, right? Um, be a part of this movie or potentially this IP that they're enjoying so much. They actually get to affect the story. It's not just happening around them. It's not just a passive experience. I think there are so many wonderful forms of medium. And look, I, I love sitting in a theater and watching a fantastic play or, or watching a movie or a TV show. But I think that VR needs to offer something different. It needs to offer maybe a new kind of user experience where we get to share these types of emotional journeys with other humans, you know, not just with very sophisticated AI or NPCs. We we're sharing them with maybe friends or people that we don't know, but we're all together as people having an actual experience <laughs> that is unique. And, and I know marketing uh, execs talk a lot about this sort of experiential marketing, right? Or things that people are, they can connect to emotionally. And that's something that everyone is really interested in. That's why they're using all these immersive experiences as marketing events, of course. Well, e exactly. But, but I think that, that, you know, the, the idea is really getting, uh, you know, your audience is, uh, you know, trained to some extent. Um, and I think that uh, the expectation factor keeps going up uh, because we've now had four or five years. So, so, uh, we, we can take some questions here. So Robin, uh, White Owen says she participated in Tender Claws and loved it. Uh, what do you look for when deciding what story to create for the next experience, which is, which was actually going to be one of my questions. So, so what, what <laughs> for, do you look for? Yeah, For sure. This is something that I talk a lot about in some of the classes that we teach, which is, you know, not every story is right for VR and, you definitely want to look at, are there opportunities for audience interaction for our purposes, the way that we do these shows, right? We want a high level of audience interaction. We want a level that we can <laughs> make. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not in video. We can't create these huge video game style worlds. And, and VR chat, the platform that we use, isn't really built for that. Per se, you can do a lot, as you see with our shows. There's quite a lot you can do, and I think it's a better platform than a lot of people realize. But we need to have something that works for that platform, that has a high level of audience interaction and potential, and is something that is topical, I think is always useful. So yeah. the dystopian sci-fi government surveillance world that Rick had originally created with his World Uncanny Alley was a very was very tasty for us and very inspiring. And the world itself was already beautiful at the moment because we do have such a small team. We're also looking for people that can bring on some of their own resources and teams as Rick as Rick could. He already had the world inspiration there. He had a set of characters and a style that we could then write a story around. Right. So, so from that standpoint, and I think that that's a great answer that you're, you're, you're really looking to some extent for, you know, an attractive world structure that, that, you know, then you can put some kind of narrative or some kind of scenic structure mm -hmm. into. And, and one thing before I get to another question is uh, you talked, uh, or at least you had a line about the number of test audiences. Uh, and I think the number was like 85 or 81 yeah. or something. <laughs> so it, yeah. it, I'm all like, what? Yeah. We do a lot of test shows because there's, as as many of you know, so much that can go wrong mm -hmm. in VR. But that's that's impressive. I'm sorry. That's it's just it. Thank I you. have to mention that. I was like, did I? Is that a typo? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really impressive, and I think it gets to that that point of what you do in the dev world. You know, uh, oh, you know, you've got alpha users, beta users through test flight or. You know, and it's like here. So it's like, no, this this is live, yeah, theater with multimodal implementations, and and everything can go wrong. Not just anything, oh, but everything. Oh yeah, I mean, because it's not just. Give us some you ideas. Have to do all the dev tests too. Right. Give us like some we, disaster. We don't just have to do the theater tests. We have to do stress testing. We have to do tech testing and and run through all those scenarios, and then 
getting in people, as you said, alpha and beta users, where people that are super comfortable and are great, you know, they, they make the show easy because we know that they are comfortable in the world. We know that they know how to use the technology. Whereas right. then we have beta users where they've never done anything in VR before. It's their first time handling headset controls, but we need mm -hmm. to be prepared for both because we get both at festivals, especially we get a lot more of the latter. Right, right. But, um, but, but, but that's, that, that's a great point made. And Ren Tyler asks, uh, what are some resources you recommend when it comes to this kind of story structure and how do you test the gameplay? So yes. uh, uh, sort of on, on the same point um you know it, it's it's uh I, I mean you know i'm sure there's some things that you would cut uh and and maybe there's some things that accidentally get woven in that weren't supposed to be there right oh, oh for sure i mean we cut an entire scene with this show actually because it was just dragging in the show and we cut it not that far before we actually brought it to Venice. um and of course we're constantly as the rehearsal process happens, we're constantly tweaking and updating the script because you see actors doing something or maybe one actor says something really great just off the cuff and you go, oh yeah, let's put that in or let's have everyone do that. Or there's a special moment like in this show, Adam and Ghost have a, a special handshake or a special little thing where they go like this and then they fist bump right mm -hmm. and that came about i believe and deirdre correct me if i'm wrong but i believe because a certain acting team started doing it or asked if they could do it so our actors definitely give us inspiration as well uh cool. resources i mean honestly uh doing world hops finding worlds connecting with other creators through places like oh it was brendan's idea okay yeah um, so it was one of our actors who said this would be a great thing for them to have mm -hmm. as their little uh, secret uh, handshake. I, I, I love that. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it, you, you, you can do that, you know, uh, in, in, in more or less a real-time way. Uh, Roberto Haza asks, uh, what are the limits you run into with these festival rollouts? Do festivals provide a limited uh, number of headsets to the audience or do you provide the hardware? Which is, which is a great question. Um, and talk about the size of your, your audience and particularly in Venice. Absolutely. Um, I just want to quickly say uh, resources. I think, like I said, going and looking at worlds, connecting with XR creators through things like so, uh, XR Social Club, where you do world hops every Monday night. Um, but also, it doesn't have to be that. I think finding things, we have a couple of scripts in the work for the Scottish play and also Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, again, known IP, right? That really helped with uh, punch drunk sleep no more things that people are like okay I can go into this with some framework some understanding of what this is and I think that's really helpful for this type of immersive theater because it can be overwhelming for people yeah I but I at the same time I think the the process of discovery is so exciting right yeah. um and by the way um a hat tip to I guess Rick for the title uh, yes. and I, uh, for those who don't know what the uncanny valley is, and I'm sure everyone does know it, but it's a Japanese term uh, about sort of expectations uh, with uh, autonomous uh, and semi-autonomous um, creatures and robots. And uh, it's been around for a while, but I think really in the last 20 years, it's, it's kind of picked up. But uncanny alley, I had never heard anyone <laughs> riff on that, and I don't know why. So, so kudos to Rick A. Yes, uh, and B. Yeah. I I don't know if 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 you can trademark that, but um, but speaking of IP, but uh, but yeah, su super super cool. Uh, you know, end to end, you know, I think concepting uh, of this, and and it just makes me uh, you know, yearn for for the next, but. Okay. This is where we people you got to cross your fingers here, okay? <laughs> uh, and so if you know Kent Buy or anybody at South Buy, um, send him a little note, you know, and say that you know you ran into Witten and you heard about <laughs> Uncanny Alley and you'd really like to see it, experience it at South Buy, uh, which um, again, you know, is really is I I feel um, certainly one of the the the, the top uh, uh, virtual festivals. Uh, it, it has uh, arisen, you know, sort of out of the pandemic and with the sadly um, things going uh, away in terms of the Sundance and Tribeca festivals. And we understand why. 
um you know the pandemic really crushed the um the cinema uh so we understand it uh, but south by it's just amazing we had rory mitchell on a couple of weeks ago uh, from the tent, which was also at South by. So, so not surprisingly, uh, this, these last two years have just, uh, been stunning in terms of the work. And, and we hope that South by 2025 includes uncanny alley. So, right. I do speaking of festivals, I do want to get to uh, Roberto's question very quickly. Um, it really depends on the festival. Some will provide headsets for us. Um, usually the number that we request. So for our shows, that's three to five for festivals usually, just because we have a limited space. You know, you have, a, like at South By, you have a little booth. And so we don't want to have too many people for our shows because you'll get the audio feedback between headsets and things. So we, we usually, the festival will provide the headsets. We usually provide headphones and any other accoutrement that we want for the festival. Sometimes they provide cabling, sometimes they don't. Uh, but things like Venice and, and high profile festivals are usually very good about that. Venice basically provides us with almost everything. So That's cool. That's very great. cool. But uh, yeah, it, it does depend on the festival. And if you're thinking about doing this sort of thing, you certainly want to have anything that you would need to do this at a at a location to do your show at a location you would want to have the headsets that you would need the headphones any cabling uh a monitor of some kind if you want to project if you want to show what's happening in world which we do for things like SIGGRAPH and other tech festivals so we do shortened versions of our shows um at SIGGRAPH last year we did a 15 minute version of gumball dreams where if you walked by, we actually had a live actor there. So you could see and hear the live actor. And then you could also see what was happening in world. And we had one person, uh, one audience member sitting. And so you could see everything that was going on, all the different levels, which led to some very funny interactions. There was one point where I was performing and someone started talking to me while I was in a headset because they thought I was just talking out <laughs> so you know again things you can never plan for but that's or, or even if you try <laughs> right and but that that's the beauty of this i mean you know let's, let's remind ourselves this is still early days if you will um uh, and that's the beauty uh michael ons is there a plan to convert uncanny alley to a single user experience after the festival run great uh, question very good question so do you mean like a standalone sort of without the live actors, something we could. I, I think, use. yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. Uh, something yeah. you could download and buy. Yes. Um, we're not sure. So, and I, I say that not to avoid the question, but more because you, what makes our thing so special is the live interaction. So we've been very loath to create something where that was not a part of it. However, I know that Rick and Steve have talked about doing some 360 video and make maybe making a filmed single user experience that we could that we could sell on a larger scale because obviously uh, that's something that is of interest to a small company like us for funding purposes. But yeah, it's it's a hard question. You know, we get asked a lot why couldn't we replace actors with AI and things like that. And I think all of us feel very strongly that keeping the human interaction is is a part of what has made us successful, but also very, very important because there isn't really a lot, there aren't really a lot of other things like this in the uh, XR, MR space at the moment where, and, and the ones that are have been very successful. I think there was a flight deck one for Star Trek that you know you could have a team of people in real time and people really loved that. And if we think back to the, the origins of the internet, chat rooms, Right. People want to be able to talk with other humans, especially in this world where so much is becoming AI. You just you just long to have a conversation with a real human in the digital space. So I, I think that's I think if we do uh, create a single user experience, it will be in partnership with our live actor experience. So 
you know, yes, you can buy this, but we will still be doing shows. So once this show has done its festival run, we will most likely do a run of public shows where people can buy tickets to come see the show. So, so a bit of both, maybe. <laughs> yes and yes. I love it. I love it. But that that's, the, you know, that, that's really pushing into new uh, domains, because I think that the IP uh, and certainly with, with this this one, I, I think kind of begs it because you, you're building such an interesting world and it's such a, uh, a topical uh, experience, shall we say. Um, and uh, uh, and I love that you talked about the whole South African issue. So there's so many levels, you know, where, where you can take this. And I just think it's super uh, exciting and um, uh, really glad that you could take time out to do this on Halloween. Uh, yes. So uh, kudos to you and Ferryman Collective for Uncanny Alley, a new day. And as we said, please send all of your good vibes and juju uh, so that, that we can uh, be with Witten and, and company at South by Southwest uh, in March in Austin. So uh, yes, please put the uh, the link to Ferryman Collective uh check it check out what they're doing and yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm like and then, there we go please. yep yep on the yeah. ig firm and vr um and and as i said uh we have um speaking of ai some note takers here uh but uh this is being <laughs> recorded so this this will um uh be uh, posted by me in various areas here see look at that see 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 elizabeth's ai note taker it's quiet in here. <laughs> do you see that what a nasty kind Weird. of intrusive right the attitudinal AI. It's just, what are we going to do? She's bored. Well, I, evidently, excusez moi. Well, dang, says Ren Tyler. And on that note, uh, really great. Thanks again. Kudos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, we're overcoming. Humans are overcoming. Um, live from LA, uh, yeah. Witten Frank from Ferryman Collective. And thank you for everyone being here, including Deer Deer Lions. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, everyone give Deer Deer kudos. Lions. She's our. Our other one of our other co-founders and amazing human yeah yeah just just great this is just great work very encouraging yeah. uh there she is oh, yay Steve. oh my uh, god the, the whole the, of Uncanny the whole Alley. crew hey. there he is. say say take a bow take a bow <laughs> come on take a bow you're in the theater or maybe not i don't know uh michael so what did you think michael great I think we, we should do a separate show at a black box somewhere in downtown <laughs> Manhattan or Brooklyn. We can come to your neck of the woods and can go to Brooklyn. Um, we should do that. I think that would be super cool. So, Michael, what do we got coming up uh, in a couple of weeks? I'm hoping to contact uh, a Ukrainian uh, well, to, to commit, c confirm a Ukrainian company that uh, Chris Colo has put me in touch with that is doing uh, AR engagements with historical sites. So that's what I fantastic I reached them yesterday. So I should have the details and we'll publish the news. This, this is great. Shortly. Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that, that I look forward to that. Uh, so stay tuned uh, because the uh, next time we'll be back here uh, and hopefully Michael uh, uh, with uh, this uh, super uh, interesting uh, Ukrainian company in two weeks, which will be Wednesday, November 13th. Uh, but in the meantime, once again, thank you to Witten Frank. And as thank always, be well, be yes. safe, and be virtual. Take care, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. This was great. Take care. <laughs>